10 years. That's how long it's been since Ken Block debuted his most legendary race car ever, the Ford Mustang Hunicorn RTR. Now look, this car deserves its whole own documentary. We could be here for an hour plus. But what we're gonna do now is we're gonna celebrate the highlights of this car, how it began, and where it may be going from here. I'm Ron Zaris. We're gonna have Leah a little bit later in this video. But for now, I'm gonna walk you through the history of this car because I had the very, very lucky privilege of being with it and being with the team from its very conception until its final form. So the idea for this car, of course, came from Ken himself. We had done a couple of Gymkhanas up until this point already, and they were all in Ford Fiestas, Subarus, all-wheel drive rally-style cars. We wanted to step the game up. Ken wanted to do something different. He wanted to go old school, he wanted something with the V8, but he needed it to handle like a rally car and he needed to be able to do Gymkhana type driving with it. So that was kind of a predicament. Nothing really existed at the time that could tick all those boxes and be a cool, unique Gymkhana car. So Ken said, let's build a Ford Mustang. Let's make it all wheel drive. And remember, this is right around 2012, 2013, where this idea first started coming around. No one had really done anything like that. So this was a brand new ground up build. So step one, you gotta know what this thing is gonna look like. You gotta get what's in your head on paper. So we started working with a guy called Andy Blackmore from Andy Blackmore Design. And we threw a bunch of different ideas at him but with kind of a focused direction. We wanted a 1965 Ford Mustang notchback. Not a fastback because at the time, everybody built fastbacks. That was a cool thing to build. Again, wanting to be a little different, taking a different direction. So we said, 1965, Mustang, notch. But let's throw a little bit of DTM at it. Let's throw a little bit of WRC. Let's get a little bit of old school racing in there too. Some cues from 70s race cars and all that. And eventually, after a long period of trial and error and getting a lot of different visuals through, we came up with this. As you can see, you do have the fender cut that's a bit WRC style. You have it sitting with the DTM type stance, super wide. But at the same time, you do have the rounded arch. All of this we had down on paper and Ken said, all right, it's time to build this thing. How are we gonna make this handle? So he called up his buddy Vaughn Gittin Jr. at RTR and he said, hey, I got this crazy idea. You build this thing called the RTRX. Obviously know your way around Mustangs. Let's build this ultimate Gymkhana vehicle. So Vaughn and RTR said, yes, of course, we're game. Let's make it happen. So we sent it to ASD Motorsports, who was building Vaughn's competition drift cars at the time. We gave them the idea and the framework and let them go for it. So ASD was up to the task of this monumental project of making a Ford Mustang handle like a rally car. And they did a couple things. They cut out the entire floor out of it, put a tube chassis, in the middle of it. They formed the bodywork out of metal with an English wheel to get the exact proportions and the styles that we wanted. Because remember at the time, 3D printing wasn't as big of a thing and fiberglass shaping was a bit tough. They wanted to do it the real way. They wanted real sheet metal on this car. The drivetrain, Sadev sequential six-speed gearbox. A dual drive shaft setup with the diff up front, a diff in the back, and a transfer case in the middle. And of course, a 410 cubic inch Roush Yates V8 topped it all off. There's turbos on here right now, but the original version of this car was naturally aspirated, making 845 horsepower. That revved super high, sounded amazing. We had side pipes going on it. This thing was an animal. But the real secret came in with the inboard suspension. Now with the cantilever style, you got a lot more suspension travel, but still able to fit the shape of this old school car. And that was the secret of what made it handle so well. And what Gymkhana car would be complete without a hydraulic handbrake? So we also had one of those installed with a diff lock button on the top. Yes, that's right. That secret red button on the top of the handbrake was a diff lock. And that really was the recipe. Now, originally this car was built for Gymkhana 6. But if you look back, it's not a Mustang in that video. So then after a year in the shop, it was time to finally test this thing. The very first time Ken ever drove it, this thing didn't even have body panels on it. Handled flawlessly. The handbrake worked. There was no overheating. 
and the all-wheel drive system did what we needed it to do. It drove just like the rally cars that Ken first started doing Jim Gymkhana with. At the time, it was mind-blowing to see something in the shape of a Ford Mustang moving around like that and spinning all four tires. The concept was proven. We had a serious car on our hands. Now we're able to go make a video. That video being Jim Connor 7. Now the only challenge, and anybody that's had a project car in their life can relate, time is never on your side. So we go into filming Jim Connor 7 with this car, with Ken only having had a total of maybe three miles of testing in it. We did the no body panel test, and then we did a quick final test, the original Hoonigan Donut Garage, just to make sure the car works with all the panels on. And we went straight into filming. The very first scene we film, in Chinatown with immovable park benches, concrete light poles, and Ken just sends this thing into the first scene. All of us were sitting there with bated breath. We had no idea what was gonna happen. We didn't have a whole lot of spares with this thing because it was just built, but Ken had this car custom tailored to his driving style. The Ken block paired with the Hunicorn ended up being the perfect combo of car and driver. How do you announce that you have an 845 horsepower all-wheel drive Mustang? We chained it up. Chained it up with the perfect profile shot to show that not only the rear wheel was spinning, but the fronts were at the same time. And that was how we introduced this car to the world. From that moment on, every minute that Ken had behind the wheel of this car just got better and better, which is good considering that we had a trick with a low rider hopping on and off its front wheels and Ken having to time perfectly to get underneath it. Now in a video, yes, you get a couple takes, but realize that at production time, this is a one-off car. You can't just go down the road to a parts store and get replacements for any of this. So it was a super high risk situation and it ended up working out perfectly. And Gymkhana 7 was one of our favorites that we ever made. Now, if you wanna know all the super, super technical nitty gritty on this car from front to back, you can check out Hoonigan's Build Biology where we walk through the car from a builder standpoint instead of more of a storyline like we're doing today. And then to cap it all off, in the middle of filming Gymkhana 7, we threw our favorite automotive journalist, Chris Harris, right in the passenger seat of this car with Ken. Looked like he had a pretty good time. Afterwards, the car ended up doing a bunch of different stuff across the world. It did a ton of demos, went on displays, it did Gymkhana Grid, and then the final video that it did in its first version, V1, the naturally aspirated car, was Top Gear in London. By that point, Ken and the car were super in tune. We had some wild moments with the Chinook helicopter. We had a jump that maybe made the team director a little uneasy because there was a lot of sparks. Really, that was a perfect send off for the end of version one of this car because what would come next would be a radical change to the drivetrain. The next mission for the Hunicorn, Pike's Peak. Not competing at the hill climb, but another idea that Ken had for the car. Now Ken and Alex Gelsomino had done Pike's Peak once in 2005, and that was in a Group N Subaru. And the thing about Pike's is it goes up until 14,000 feet above sea level. What happens to a car, turbocharged or not, is you lose a lot of horsepower by the top. And we knew we wanted to bring the Hunicorn up there, but we also knew at the time that by the top, it's gonna be really, really hard to spin the 295 width tires that this thing has all around. So the next logical step, forced induction in the form of two turbos and a lot of methanol. Pikes Peak is a really unforgiving place. So when we turboed this car, it was the same Roush Yates V8, but we downed the compression a little bit. We threw methanol at it so we could get really, really good, quick response. Didn't need an intercooler and ended up making a 1400 horsepower monster. The first time Ken tested this car in its new turbo form, Ken was laughing so hard. He said that every single gear, it'll spin all four tires super, super easy. It was an absolute animal. It was a scary car for him to drive. He said he was even terrified taking it into turns on a normal racetrack, let alone up on Pike's Peak. So now we have this absolute beast of a car that spins 295 width tires 
in any gear at any time. And Ken took it up the mountain at Pikes Peak, giving us Climb Kana, as well as one of the most iconic moments this car ever had, sliding out sideways, hanging the rear bumper off of Evo Corner on Pikes. Now the new version of this car, with its turbos and meth, we dubbed the Hoonicorn V2. After Climb Kana, the next mission for this car was one of the most ambitious film projects that we ever took on as a team, and that was Gymkhana 10. Five cars, five locations. One of those locations was Detroit. When we looked at the whole lineup of cars, there was really only one car we could bring there. And of course, that was the Hoonicorn. Now, when you watch the Detroit part of Gymkhana 10, think about this. What you have here is probably the equivalent of an eight second car. Now, eight seconds in a quarter mile, just keeping that straight, it's a lot of work. But with Ken, he was able to take the bumper put it right where he wanted it, around a Segway, right off the edge of a curb. And of course, who could forget one of my favorite moments in the film, absolutely sending it backwards entry into an intersection, covered in smoke and pulling it right back through. Ken and this car, I've said it before, I'll say it again, it was such an epic combo. Now on the subject of drag racing, that was always a thing that we had talked about. We wanted to see how this would stack up against other drag racing cars. Now, taking it to a prepared drag strip, the drivetrain isn't really set up for that. For Gymkhana, you're not on a pure race slick. You're on more of a performance street tire. So we said, why don't we try some no prep racing? At the time on Hoonigan, we had a show called This Versus That. We had an airstrip, we had two cars that were quite different from each other, and we would drag race them. So we said, why don't we make a special with our favorite car ever, the Hoonicorn, and call it Hoonicorn versus the world. Now, when we first did the lineups, we thought, yeah, let's pull together a bunch of fast drag cars, experienced drivers, and make a really wide range of vehicles that it would lose against some, it would win against others. We really had no idea what this would do on an unprepped surface. And in doing that, kind of created a big problem for ourselves because what we ended up doing is totally underestimating the speed of this car. Every single car that we had lined up against this thing ended up losing. Well, except one, Hank Iroz in his Audi RS3 put up a really, really good fight. It was a super epic episode. That car is bespoke, built for drag racing. This, no cool down times, nothing broke. It just would go run after run after run after run. And that moment was such a testament to the car build, to the driver, to everything this car had achieved, that it could do that well at drag racing and it was never ever built as a drag car. One year later, we knew we wanted to do another series of Hoonicorn vs. the World, but we had a couple little changes to make, and that is what brought us to the final form of the car you see here today. We changed the wheel setup to American Racing D-Window style wheels. We got the custom Borla exhausts and the livery as you see it today, and also switched the paddle shifters and changed a couple little safety items around. And we also moved the seat forward a little bit because we had another driver, a different driver, 14-year-old driver, this driver right here. Miss Leah Block. What's up? Um, I, I would say a lot of it forward, actually. A lot of it? Seat, <laughs> yeah, that know. was a I am kind of like seating change. Grandma <laughs> kind of driving up here. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you got to grow up watching this car go through all of its phases. Did yeah, you, I remember we got a video sent to our group chat or something, and it was just the unicorn, bare body, nothing. Yeah. And it was my dad testing it down in Las Vegas, like for the first time. So it's had a long life and it's done a lot of things. Um, and I'm very thankful that I got to drive it. Yeah. Um, so what was that feeling when we first started talking about uh, maybe we should have Leah do Unicorn vs. the World? I remember actually sitting in this race shop with Brian, who was interviewing me, and I didn't know what the interview was for. It was kind of weird. And my dad was behind the camera, and Brian just popped the question. He was like, do you want to drive the Unicorn app? Immediate yes, of course. Who wouldn't want to? Would you want to drive the next season of Unicorn vs. the World? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think looking back on it now, like Unicorn vs. the World 2, like getting to do that season, driving it for, for the first time down in Las Vegas at the Speedway, like I was told a year later that the training was to see if I could actually drive it. If you, you could know? even handle it. I can even handle it because yeah. they didn't know if I could do the series, you know? They didn't yeah. know how I was going to be, if I was going to be able to drive the car, you know? It's not your normal car at all, you know? This is a one-of-one one monster, and still to this day, it scares me a little bit. 
you know? I bet I cannot <laughs> even imagine because we talked about before at this power level, it spins all four wheels in any gear you're in at any time. This thing does not want to stay straight, anything but straight. But you did a really good job of it. You handled it extremely well. And I do have to say, when we were on site, we had seasoned drag racers right out there and your reaction times were wild. Well, a lot of people like to say that I've cheated on my reaction times. Uh, uh, YouTube, YouTube said that. Yeah, YouTube, YouTube said that, but you, they don't know real drag racing. That's right. Like, a chase is a race. Chase, chase is a race. race. And but also, the, you watch the elbows. There was one time Zach went back. Yeah, he went back right. before he went forward, and right. I went on the back, because he moved. He moved. He moved. And that was fair. Well, let's run it back a little bit. So. You did a little bit of driving, not a whole lot, but before we filmed that whole series, you did get to experience the car. So tell us the very first time you ever drove this car. What was that feeling like? Well, I remember the very first time, like we had a bunch of different tests, you know, leading up to driving the Hunicorn. I got to, you know, go down and talk Donk Master about, you know, yep, the Sage, real uh, drag racing, street drag racing, you know, and then got to work with Leah Pruitt on reacting time and going to a real drag trip. And then I think it was, yeah, at Las Vegas Speedway, first was with Hank Iroz in yep. his Audi, um, which was very powerful. Uh, and then finally we went to drive the Kazi for the first time. So I got to learn how to do all wheel drive donuts in that before I ever got in the Unicorn, just to, you know, kind of slowly build it up, you know, yeah. get a more powerful car every time and then straight into the Unicorn. But I believe my dad caught it on fire before I drove it. <laughs> so it was a little bit- I don't bit remember that one. Racket. I wasn't around for that. He took Alex Gelsomino, his co-driver, yeah. for a ride in it before he let me do donuts in it. And it caught on fire. So it was just like, oh my gosh. Okay, what am I about to drive? You know, like that- <laughs> That's pretty that's intimidating. That's really comforting, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> but I mean, I don't think I was ever prepared for what it would feel like to drive this car. I the first time you went through all the gears. All the gears. And it just keeps pulling and pulling. And it was like this straightaway on this track that had a bend through it. And I was scared to death because you couldn't see the bend. And I was, I mean, this thing, like it was going fast, but I felt like I was going 300 miles an hour. Because yeah. the torque and the, the shear, like it just like slams you to the back of the seat. On every shift. You know, shift. on every shift. Yeah. Like it's super aggressive and you really feel all of the raw power. I passed the test, I guess, because I got to drive it more. And then by the time we got to the track, she was absolutely crushing it. Every pass, she's treating it like a seasoned pro, but she's good with keeping the game face on. I mean, looking back, I don't know who made that decision to let me drive that car. I don't know. I don't think it was very responsible, but... You were a part of it, too. You were a part of it, Well, too. yeah, I was 14. Yeah. But had, had you ever ridden along in the car? I think in Gymkhana 7, did you get a ride along or? Uh, not that I can remember. Okay. Um, the first time I think I went in the car to do anything was at that speedway before my dad let me drive it. Yeah. He took me and did some donuts and just did one pass down the street. Just to let me feel what it felt like, you know. It's mostly like, what ifs? Like, if things go wrong, yeah, this is what, what you do should you do. do. Like, you know, yeah. I can drive it in a straight line, you know but people don't realize how many other things you're having to control because how aggressive this car is, you know, with how much Absolutely. power it is. Like, it's so difficult just to keep it going in one straight line and keep all four wheels, you know, spinning at the same time. Not so, to mention you got to react to the driver next to you. And if you look at the track, the airstrip at Santa Margarita, it's crowned. And on the left side, there's a bump too. So you got all these things to consider and racing another car. And Leah just got in there, treated it like an absolute pro. I got to ask, after doing all that and all these different race cars you've driven now, you still think about driving this thing from time to time? Oh, I, I like dream about it, you know? Like this thing, it, it, you know how I like dream about like rainbows? This is my rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> the unicorn is your rainbow. My rainbow. <laughs> I don't know. The straight line speed stuff was really fun, like shooting unicorn reverse of the world. Um, and just trying to keep it together. But I mean, my favorite is just to do what it was built for and do donuts and make smoke, you know? <laughs> so you heard it here first. So then after Unicorn vs. The World 2, we put her in another crazy situation, as we always do, as she tends to shine in. SEMA Fest in Las Vegas, 2023, was almost exactly a year ago. We put her out in front of a whole live crowd of people, no video editing. 
This is live. No redos. There's a lot of cell phone cameras. There's a live feed. And we're like, hey, we know you didn't do any donuts or like really practice on the handbrake or anything, but just go out there and, I don't know, tandem with Travis Pastrana. Around an airboat. Around an airboat. <laughs> or an airplane. Hanging no. from a crane. And you did it. You did an amazing job. That was really stressful, I'm not gonna lie. That was the first time I'd right. ever done any sort of demo in front of people. Everything had been filmed, um, you know, and it would come out like as a YouTube video, and right. stuff like that, and go out on Instagram. I had one chance to get this stuff right, you yeah. know? And the first time I was doing donuts around obstacles that weren't like a cone, around airplanes, an airboat, yep. doing tandem with Travis Pastrana. It was really nerve wracking, but you know, I, I knew I could sort of control the car and just, you know, had fun with it. Once again, so, trial by fire. Trial by fire. Literally sums up my entire life. <laughs> Somehow I strive in those situations and, and I had a lot of fun, um, you know, the methanol just making you cry. Yeah, <laughs> which you need the special methanol helmet because otherwise it, it literally, you can't see. Well, I remember Unicorn versus the world. I'd come back from a run. My eyes would just be bawling yeah. because all you would stop and then all the methanol would just get to rush you, into and rush in. And you just be bawling on the way back. And you're like, like open your helmet, like trying to like not it's look a car like that you're makes crying. You cry in more ways than one. Yeah. So that's it. Ten years, an incredible run, way beyond anything we ever thought this car would do. Anything beyond anything we thought was capable. It's been amazing. I think you got a future in doing some things with this car. So comment below. Hey. Let us know. I would never pass up an opportunity to drive this car ever. Um, even like the other day, they were like, hey, can you come move the unicorn from the back of the shop to the front? I was like, of course, I'll be there in five minutes. <laughs> I will see you right there. See you right there. Don't worry. Wait for me. <laughs> Any chance. Any chance. So speaking of, because the sun is going down, we could turn the lights off in here. because There's no way we're ending this video without giving you a little bit of fireballs, a little bit of engine noise. So I don't know. You want to fire it up? Let's do it. Let's do it. So there you have it, 10 years of the Ford Mustang Unicorn RTR. Honestly, an epic run. We never thought it would go this far. So what would you want to see this car do? Do you think it should sit here in the form it is now? Do you think it should evolve? Who else should we put in the car? Should we ever put anybody else in the car? Let us know. Hit the comments, hit like, hit subscribe, and thank you for watching.